Well, good evening and welcome to Vespers on this Monday of the 25th week after Pentecost. Thanks for being with me tonight. Uh, the scriptures we're going to be reading are Psalm number 29. Um, we're going to move into another book in the Old Testament, Zephaniah chapter 1, and we'll be in Revelation chapter 14. Now let's begin with a word of prayer. Would you please pray with me? Bless us, O God, with a reverent sense of your presence, that we may be at peace and may worship you with all our mind and spirit, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Jesus Christ is the light of the world, the light no darkness can overcome. Stay with us, Lord, for it is evening, and the day is almost over. Let your light scatter the darkness and illumine your church. Joyous light of glory of the immortal Father, heavenly, holy, blessed Jesus Christ. We have come to the setting of the sun and we look to the evening light. We sing to God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You are worthy of being praised with pure voices forever. O Son of God, O giver of life, the universe proclaims your glory. The Lord be with you. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who led your people Israel by a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. Enlighten our darkness by the light of your Christ. May his word be a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. For you are merciful, and you love your whole creation. And we, your creatures, glorify you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. <clears throat> Let my prayer rise before you as incense, the lifting up of my hands as the evening sacrifice. O Lord, I call to you, come to me quickly. Hear my voice when I cry to you. Let my prayer rise before you as incense, the lifting up of my hands as the evening sacrifice. Set a watch before my mouth, O Lord, and guard the door of my lips. Let not my heart incline to any evil thing. Let me not be occupied in wickedness with evildoers, but my eyes are turned to you, Lord God. In you I take refuge. Strip me not of my life. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Let my prayer rise before you as incense, the lifting up of my hands as the evening sacrifice. Let the incense of our repentant prayer ascend before you, O Lord, and let your loving kindness descend upon us, that with purified minds we may sing your praises with the church on earth and the whole heavenly host, and may glorify you forever and ever. Amen. Okay. Our psalm is number 29. Ascribe to the Lord, you gods. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. The voice of the Lord is upon the waters. The God of glory thunders. The Lord is upon the mighty waters. The voice of the Lord is a powerful voice. The voice of the Lord is a voice of splendor. The voice of the Lord breaks the cedar trees. The Lord breaks the cedar trees of Lebanon. He makes Lebanon skip like a calf and Mount Hermon like a young wild ox. The voice of the Lord splits the flames of fire. The voice of the Lord shakes the wilderness. The Lord shakes the wilderness of Kadesh. The voice of the Lord makes the oak trees writhe and strips the forests bare. And in the temple of the Lord, all are crying glory. The Lord sits enthroned above the flood. The Lord sits enthroned as king forevermore. The Lord shall give strength to his people. The Lord shall give his people the blessing of peace. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. <clears throat> Let us pray. 
Lord, our King, your voice sounds over the waters as you reign above the flood. Help us, who are born again by water and the Holy Spirit, to praise your wonderful deeds in your holy temple. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. <clears throat> okay, our first reading, Zephaniah. We're going to, uh, we'll be in chapter one. If you want to go back and read the first six verses, that's what we would have read yesterday. Uh, today, we're going to start at verse seven and read verses seven to 13. The day of the Lord is near. Be silent before the Lord God, for the day of the Lord is near. The Lord has prepared a sacrifice and consecrated his guests. And on the day of the Lord's sacrifice, I will punish the officials and the king's sons and all who array themselves in foreign attire. On that day, I will punish everyone who leaps over the threshold and those who fill their master's house with violence and fraud. On that day, declares the Lord, a cry will be heard from the fish gate, a wail from the second quarter, a loud crash from the hills. Wail, O inhabitants of the mortar, for all the traitors are no more. All who weigh out silver are cut off. At that time, I will search Jerusalem with lamps, and I will punish the men who are complacent, those who say in their hearts, the Lord will not do good, nor will he do ill. Their goods shall be plundered, and their houses laid waste. Though they build houses, they shall not inhabit them. Though they plant vineyards, they shall not drink wine from them. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Okay. <clears throat> so, Zephaniah, another one of the minor prophets in the Old Testament. Um, so, um, this was written between 640 and 609 BC, right? Um, he li Zephaniah lived in the time of the prophet Jeremiah, and he prophesied under King Josiah, as did Jeremiah. And so he prophesies the very same things as Jeremiah, namely that Jerusalem and Judah shall be destroyed and the people carried away because of their wicked life. They are unwilling to repent. So, but Jeremiah names the, names the king of Babylon. Zephaniah does not. So there's a few differences in the two. But it's interesting we get two different um, prophets preaching the same thing to the people and they still don't repent, right? Be silent before the Lord God, all right? So these little post-it note looking things, these are notes I've made from before. God doesn't want to hear excuses. He's already warned the people, right? Um, the day of the Lord is near. This is kind of a judgment day, right? The Lord has prepared a sacrifice, consecrated his guests. Um, it's also appropriate in God's presence to keep silent, right? God's going to speak. Don't try to talk over him. Uh, Lord God, this is literally in Hebrew, the Lord Yahweh. Um, so, uh, let's see. Hello? I think it's, uh, oh, Adonai. Sorry, I've got that very wrong. Adonai. That's Lord. And you can see here, this is Yah. Yahava, right? Jehovah, Yahweh. Okay, there's no J sound in in Hebrew, so um, it, this is a Y. Um, so, and remember, you read right, right to left, but um, they've reordered it so we could see underneath each English word how it's translated. So, uh, Adonai Elohim. They would never say Adon. A Jew would never pronounce the. This word, this is the word they will that will never come from a uh, a Jew's lips. They don't want to ever risk violating that commandment, so they would substitute Elohim um, instead of Yahweh. Um, anyway, um, so when in the presence of the Almighty God, be silent. And in this case, since we already know that this prophet has come to tell the people what's about to happen to them, that, that God's wrath is coming. It's no longer time to make excuses. It's no longer time to 
try to verbally defend themselves. The day of the Lord is near. Wrath is coming. Um, the Lord is going to act. Um, and it is anticipation of both wrath and salvation, which will come together on Judgment Day. Um, the Lord has prepared a sacrifice that it be the nation of Judah and consecrated his guests. That's a foreign nation that God will appoint to consume the sacrifice, right? We know that will be Babylon, but um, interesting how they're calling the foreign invaders the Lord's guests. Well, God has invited them to be the instruments of his wrath. So they are his guests and they will consume the sacrifice. Quite an interesting allegory, isn't it? So on the day of the Lord's sacrifice, right? Back to, and then you got the quotation marks. Saying, okay, back to the word again, the, uh, back to God's word again. I will punish the officials and the king's sons and all who array themselves in foreign attire. Okay, what's going on here? This is, um, they were wearing different clothing, different things in their worship of foreign gods and pagan gods. And this is exactly why they're feeling God's wrath. They're violating the very first commandment. You shall have no other gods. And that's exactly what they did. I, I, it's hard to imagine that they would. <laughs> yeah. So. Um, God is singling out the officials and the king's sons. These are the leaders. These are the leaders over God's people. They are the ones who have led the people into this disobedience. So they are the focal point of God's wrath. God's going to start there. I'm going to punish the officials and the king's sons and everyone who array themselves in foreign, who dress to worship pagan gods. On that day, I will punish everyone who leaps over the threshold. All right. This is a little interesting. All right. Um, a superstitious practice, which was done by the priests. Okay. Um, the Philistine priests who dared not step on the threshold of Dagon's temple. Dagon was one of their pagan gods, a fish god. Um, and so they, they, this was a, a recognition of a pagan god's power. It's almost an act of worship. Those who fill their master's house with violence and fraud, their Lord's house. Um, yeah. So there was different kinds of unjust, like violence. Um, these are two instruments they use to gain money and power. Um Fraud, of course, dishonesty and trickery. This would be, think of this as like robbery, okay? They were doing things that were not godly. <laughs> On that day, declares the Lord, a cry will be heard from the fish gate. All right, um, that's Jerusalem's north wall. Um, the discovery of fish bones has confirmed that there was a fish market there. It was likely stocked with dried or salted fish. Um. They had to be preserved somehow. The sources of fish that were nearest were not close enough to have those fish on the market like that without some kind of preser uh, preservative. So anyway, so it was it was called the fish gate because of that. A whale from the second quarter. Jerusalem was divided into quarters. Um, probably the western hill of Jerusalem, which was an area with newer and wealthier homes. Okay. A loud crash from the hills. All of Judah's hills, that's the area surrounding Jerusalem. But all of those hills will be filled with the sounds of chaos and destruction. Oh, whale, O oh, inhabitants of the mortar. Interesting. Um, that might have been a business area which was located in a shallow valley in Jerusalem. We're not sure. Traders or business people uh, referred to as Canaanites who spent their whole lives in pursuit of money. All the traders are no more. All who weigh out silver are cut off, right? Um, silver was one of their 
um, one of their monies, one of their currencies, uh, weighing out silver, not, not really coins, but just pieces of silver. They would just cut some off, break some off, and used by weight as their monetary exchange. At that time, I will search Jerusalem with lamps. Just like somebody uses a lamp at night to make a thorough search, the Lord will search meticulously through Jerusalem. I will punish the men who are complacent. <sighs> Those who say in their hearts, the Lord will not do good, nor will he do ill. All right, so there were some Judeans who had become like pagans, believing that the Lord would neither help them nor harm them. This is the same as some of the early founders of the United States who were what you would call deists, okay? A deist is someone who believes that God is, you know, he acted in creation, and then he stepped back and just sits by and watches while we live our lives. He is a to them, he is an uninvolved God. That is not who the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is. That is not the that is not the God who sent his son to sacrifice for us. But this is there are people who have this belief about the creator of the universe. They're going to be punished. They're going to be punished. God's going to search them out, and he will find them and he will punish them. Those who are yeah, those who are complacent. All right, last verse. Their goods shall be plundered, their houses laid waste. And though they build houses, they shall not inhabit them, and they plant vineyards, but will not drink wine from them. Their efforts will be fruitless. Um, just like practical atheists in any age, the people of Judah valued only their wealth, their real estate, and their business, and the Lord would destroy all of it. He's going to show them who it belongs to. It all belongs to him anyway, and he can take it back whenever he wants. And if he has to do that to prove a point, he will. So, all right. So, when you turn away from God, expect that there will be consequences. And these people saw that. And now they were being told it's coming. So, all right. I know that's a bit harsh, but we'll pick up right there with a verse, verse 14 tomorrow. For now, let's go back to Revelation, and we're in chapter 14 today, and we're going to read verses 1 through 13. This is St. John speaking of what has been revealed to him. Then I looked, and behold, on Mount Zion stood the Lamb, and with him 144,000, who had his name and his father's name written on their foreheads. And I heard a voice from heaven, like the roar of many waters and like the sound of thunder, loud thunder. The voice I heard was like the sound of harpists playing on their harps, and they were singing a new song before the throne, and before the four living creatures, and before the elders. No one could learn that song except the 144,000 who had been redeemed from the earth. It is these who have not defiled themselves with women, for they are virgins. It is these who follow the Lamb wherever he goes. These have been redeemed from mankind as first fruits for God and the Lamb. And in their mouth was no lie found, for they are blameless. Then I saw another angel flying directly overhead with an eternal gospel to proclaim to those who dwell on earth, to every nation and tribe and language and people. And he said with a loud voice, Fear God and give him glory, because the hour of his judgment is come, and worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea and the springs of water. And another angel, a second, followed, saying, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great, she who made all nations drink the wine of the passion of her sexual immorality. And another angel, a third, followed them, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast in its image and creates a mark on his forehead or on his hand, he also will drink the wine of God's wrath, poured full strength into the cup of his anger. He will be tormented with fire and sulfur, in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever, and they have no rest, day or night, these worshippers of the beast in its image. And whoever receives the mark of its name, here is a call for the endurance of the saints, those who keep the commandments of God and their faith in Jesus. 
And I heard a voice from heaven saying, write this, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Blessed indeed, says the spirit, that they may rest from their labors for their deeds follow them. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Okay, so, so Saturday's reading was Revelation 11 to 18, talking about the second beast, right? The first beast was um, Friday's reading, okay? We we talked about the, the ten horns and the seven heads and the ten diadems and all that. Um, now, the second beast um, was had was different in appearance, right? But both of these had purposes of destruction, right? So, um, so today's reading starts out with, here's the scene with the lamb and his 144,000. They had been sealed with the seal of Christ. And so Christ's name and his father's name written on their foreheads, okay? They were the ones that were to be protected, and when we when we uh, started back a couple weeks ago in chapter seven, and I heard a voice from heaven, like the roar of waters and the sound of loud thunder. Okay, um, yeah, all right. So it says this scene looks much like chapter seven. So. We can imagine that this scene is taking place in heaven. Um, so this sound, there's a voice that John hears. It says, he says, it's actually a multitude of harpists playing and singing, right? So it's a heavenly voice, sound of harpists playing on their harps, singing, before the throne, the four living creatures and the, the 24 elders, right? The 12 for the tribes and the 12 for the apostles, 24. Um, no one could learn that song except the 144,000. This new song is beyond the comprehension of earthbound souls, especially unbelievers. They can neither hear it nor participate in it. The 144,000 represent the saints who've been delivered from the earth and received into heaven, and their new glorified existence includes the learning and singing of the new song. So they have been glorified. Um, so, all right, they've not defiled themselves with women. All right, now here's something we, we, we need to think about this for a second, because within the bonds of holy matrimony, Physical intimacy between husband and wife is considered a gift from God. That is not an act of defilement, okay? So this has to mean this expression here is figurative, okay? Um, we suspect that the 144,000 are those who were slain for refusing to worship the beast in chapter 13, right? So... Uh, All right. It was allowed to give breath to the image of the beast, so the image of the beast might even speak and might cause those who would not worship the image of the beast to be slain, right? This this had happened to some. So there were some who were martyrs because they chose to remain true to their God, right? So um, they either refused to worship the beast or they refused to receive his mark or both, right? And that was the next phrase. It also it also also it causes all small and great, rich and poor, free and slave to be marked on the right hand of the forehead, so that no one can buy or sell unless he has the mark. And if they didn't do that, they would be slain. So that's some of who these hundred forty four thousand are. They have not defiled themselves; they are untainted. They follow the Lamb wherever He goes. They have been redeemed from mankind as first fruits. In their mouth was no lie found. They are blameless. They lived righteously. Um, when Paul describes the church as church, church as Christ's bride, holy and without blemish, he means that she, the church, maintains purity by staying faithful to God and keeping his commandments. 
All right. So in their mouth was no lie found. They refused to join in the worship of the beast. They resisted the lie that this beast was divine and worthy of devotion. And they're described as having washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the lamb. So that's who the 144,000 are. And we have the messages of the three angels. The first one with an eternal angel to those who dwell uh, with an eternal gospel to proclaim to those who dwell on earth. Every nation, tribe, language, and people, right? The gospel is supposed to be shared with everyone, and this angel is doing that. Fear God and give him glory. Um, first blush doesn't sound much like the gospel, does it? Fear God, give him glory as our judgment has come. Doesn't sound good, but it is indeed good news for the faithful, since the saints are repeatedly depicted as suffering at the hand of evildoers in Revelation. So now God's judgment comes. The righteous will be, or the faithful, I should say, will be redeemed. And the evildoers who oppress them will suffer God's wrath. Right? Worship him who made heaven and earth, sea, and springs of water. Worship the creator of all creation. Right? So the faithful now see this as good news. Non-believers should fear. Rightfully so. Second angel. Fallen is Babylon the great, she who made all nations drink the wine of the passion of her sexual immorality. This is that um, sometimes referred to as the whore of Babylon. This is the first mention of a figure that subsequently plays a large role. Um, many people thought this referred to um, the imperial capital capital of John's time, which was Rome, but um, very clearly here, Babylon, whoever this is, is shown to be working with the two beasts, right? And again, this sexual immorality, remember, both in the Old Testament and in the New Testament, the relationship between God and the people is seen as a marriage, a wet, a uh, um, you know, a husband and wife, a bride and a groom. Um, and when, you know, God being the groom, Jesus being the groom, the people being the bride, when the people worship another God, God takes it as infidelity in marriage, takes it as cheating. In the Old Testament, you remember when we were in Hosea, he he likened it to uh, an unfaithful woman who was so unfaithful that it was like she was a prostitute. Right? So in Rome, certainly the Roman culture worshiped many gods, not just one. So it would be viewed as sexual immorality. Third angel, if anyone worships the beast in its image and receives the mark on forehead or hand, he will also drink the wine of God's wrath. Those who caved and took that mark, this is the actual feat of those who worship the beast. They will feel, they will drink God, the, the wine of God's wrath, poured full strength into the cup of his anger, be tormented with fire and sulfur in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. God and the heavenly host will witness this punishment. The smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever. Right? It's a very large column of smoke, too tall to see the top. The final judgment will be public and for all to see. Right? They have no rest day or night, these worshipers of the beast in its image, and whoever receives the mark of its name. If they worship, or receive the mark, they will be punished. Here is a call for the endurance of the saints, those who keep the commandments of God and their faith in Jesus. It would be good to endure, right? Just as God provides eternal joy and security for his saints, so also eternal shame and torment await those who reject him. Um, as for verse 12, there's a note here. Um, 
The beleaguered church is encouraged to believe that whatever comes, their eternal election is secure. They know God will save them in the end. And the voice from heaven saying, write this, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Right? Those who die in the Lord. This is the second of seven Beatitudes. This blessing comes at a decisive moment as the final judgment is about to be revealed. Uh, boy, there's a lot on this one. Blessed are those who die in the Lord whose deeds follow them. Because their deeds give evidence of their faith in Jesus, right? Good works are evidence of faith. Those who persevere in serving Jesus, even in the midst of intense persecution, will receive eternal rest, which is the ultimate blessing from God. We are called to persevere. They will be given rest. Okay, let's conclude our liturgy. In many and various ways, God spoke to his people of old by the prophets. But now in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son. My soul proclaims the greatness of the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. For he has looked with favor on his lowly servant. From this day, all generations will call me blessed. The Almighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. He has mercy on those who fear him in every generation. He has shown the strength of his arm. He has scattered the proud in their conceit. He has cast down the mighty from their thrones and has lifted up the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things and the rich he has sent away empty. He has come to the help of his servant Israel. For he has remembered his promise of mercy, the promise he made to our fathers, to Abraham and his children forever. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and will be forever. Amen. Alleluia. Give glory to God, our light and our life. O come, let us worship him. Alleluia. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the church of God and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For this holy gathering and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For Dan, our bishop, for Amy, our general secretary, for Steve, our dean, for your servant, for Nelson, for Henry, for Rebecca, for all our pastors in Christ, for all servants of the church and for all the people, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For our public servants, for the government and those who protect us, that they may be upheld and strengthened in every good deed. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For those who work to bring peace, justice, health, and protection in this and every place, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For those who bring offerings, those who do good works in their congregation, those who toil, those who sing, and all the people here present who await from the Lord great and abundant mercy, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy for favorable weather, for an abundance of the fruits of the earth, and for peaceful times. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For our deliverance from all affliction, wrath, danger, and need, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the faithful who have gone before us and are at rest, let us give thanks to the Lord. Alleluia. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Rejoicing in the fellowship of all the saints, let us commend ourselves, one another, and our whole life to Christ our Lord, to you, O Lord. O God, from whom come all holy desires, all good counsels, and all just works, give to us, your servants, that peace which the world cannot give, that our hearts may be set to obey your commandments, and also that we, being defended from the fear of our enemies, may live in peace and quietness through the merits of Jesus Christ, our Savior, 
who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, God forever. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. Now the almighty and merciful Lord, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit bless and preserve you. Amen. That concludes our Vespers for this Monday. Thank you for spending this time in the Word with me. And thank you for giving back to God a little bit of the day he's given to you. Uh, I think we're set for a relatively normal week. So we'll plan for Vespers tomorrow night and then Matins the rest of the week. So I hope you can join me for some of that, if not all. So, uh, But I do appreciate you being here. I wish you a blessed rest of your evening. And until we can be together again, whenever that is, may God bless and keep you.